Good afternoon, everyone, and you're all very welcome to our AWARE webinar today on relationships and mental health. So for those of you who are new to our webinar series, these take place on the second Wednesday of every month. Each one looks at a different topic relating to mental health and features clinical and lived experience experts. So if this is your first time attending an AWARE webinar, you're very welcome. We hope you enjoy today's session. And I'd really encourage you to have a look on our website, aware.ie, and sign up for emails to find out each month on upcoming events. So we're just going to wait a minute or two to let people join. So just taking a second to settle in and we'll get going shortly. So welcome to those just joining now. I see people trickling in. So my name is Dr. Susan Brannock. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical director with AWARE. So today's webinar will focus on relationships and how they can impact on our physical and mental health. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Anne-Marie Craven and Emma Kirwan, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we get going, a couple of things on AWARE and our conversation today. So for those of you who aren't familiar with AWARE, we provide free support services and well-being programs for anyone affected by depression, bipolar disorders and anxiety, and including those supporting a loved ones. So we've got a huge amount of mental health resources on our website. And um, if you want to have a look at aware.ie after our session today. So as we talk through our topic today in relationships, really, really welcoming any questions that you might have. So you can ask questions during the webinar. So via the Q&A box. So while we can't answer every question, we'll really try to answer as many as we can. Unfortunately, we can't comment directly on specifics uh, for people, but hopefully we'll give you enough kind of food for thought for today. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to introduce Anne-Marie Craven, who's a senior lecturer in psychology in Limerick, and Emma Kirwan, who is a PhD candidate also in UL. So maybe if I invite you, Anne-Marie, first just to introduce yourself, say a bit Please. about your background and then come to you, Emma. Thank you, Susan, and thank you everyone for being here today. One of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer in psychology at UL, and I suppose I'm interested broadly in how social relationships impact our physical and mental health in different ways. So some of that relates to loneliness, which is what other Emma will talk about, but also topics like um, the support you might need or receive during stressful times, like when you have been diagnosed with an illness or undergo a chronic illness. So that's my main research focus at the moment. And I'll pass back to you, Susan. OK, great. Thanks, Emery. And Emma, do you want to introduce yourself and just say a bit yeah. about your research background? Thanks, Susan. So thanks for having us. Delighted to be here. Um, yes, my name is Emma. and I'm in the third year of my PhD at the University of Limerick. And my PhD research focuses on loneliness in young or emerging adulthood, so the age of about 18 to 25 years. So I'm really trying to understand the experience better in this age group because we know quite a bit about loneliness in older adults, but younger adults, um, we tend not to know quite as much about loneliness in that group. So that's what my PhD uh, focuses on. Great. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to hear a lot more about that today. It's certainly not spoken about as much as it. And, and I guess I'm, I'm really glad to be having this conversation with yourselves as researchers, just thinking about our topic today and certainly in, in mental health and clinical psychology, we can maybe focus a lot on the person's internal world, you know, their mind, body and how that can, I suppose, how that can influence how they navigate the world, but maybe less focus on our relationships, how our external world directly affects our health. Um, whereas obviously they're both really interlinked, aren't they? So maybe Anne-Marie, starting with you, do you want to start by giving us a bit of an overview on how our connections might generally influence our health. Yeah, so there's so many different ways when you stop to think about it. And some of the ways we talk about in a in a school setting for a project I'm involved with, um, some of those most popular ways I'm going to share today. So one way is that the people in our lives act as models or demonstrators, I suppose, of different health behaviours. So you might look out the window and see your neighbour heading off for a walk and think, Do you know what, that's a good idea. I need to go out for a stroll as well. So they influence your health behavior is that that way mm -hmm. and another way is of course by actually actively encouraging people to do particular healthy things and of course unhealthy things but some of those healthy things might be for example coming to an exercise class maybe there'll be support for you when you want to quit smoking they might remind you to take medication so people in our lives can influence us directly that way as well and I suppose most of us in psychology we believe at least most of us uh, have this fundamental need to belong. 
and social connections. So that's friends, family, colleagues, romantic relationships, people in our community. They meet that need in the same way that we might feel hunger or thirst. We have this need to belong and to feel part of a community. So relationships meet that need as well. And of course, relationships are sources of support at times of stress. And this is an area I'm especially interested in. So when I mean support, I mean emotional and practical support. So emotional support is someone being there at a time of stress, listening to your problems. And practical support is maybe giving you a lift to an appointment or something like that. And of course, we can also see the, the flip side, you know, all of us that in our, in our own way might be supporters of somebody. And that's good for the other person, usually. But it also might give us a sense of competence. Like I did something nice for somebody. I was really effective today. And that can boost our own mental health as well. So those are some of the main ways, the modeling, the encouraging, yeah. the emotional piece and the support as well. Mm. yeah it's interesting isn't it there's loads of levels to it and I guess just even thinking about that I suppose people don't come as blank slates to relationships either do they no. so I guess I because I'd really imagine that kind of how you might relate to the person and you might say more about that might influence how they might you might kind of take from their behavior I guess it's how you might view them how close they might be to you so of, of whether you might kind of want to do similar things with them or or be influenced by them yeah, and you know what, when I initially got interested in this topic, I started doing my PhD research like Emma's doing now on the topic of social support. Mm. And I was interested in understanding how people responded to receiving and giving support in mm. a lab context. So we're looking at the kind of stress response associated with that. Mm. And as time went on, I realized that it's really, really difficult, probably almost impossible to isolate one single interaction from that complex web and tapestry of all your connections so I might do something nice for my mom someday and she'll be happy because it's me who's doing it but somebody might give the same support to her and she might not be so keen right or for example I have a great relationship I'd like to think with two small children at home but you know they're quite independent they don't want me to help or if, if they want help they only want mammy right so that relationship history with people is so important and how similar you see yourself whether they're in your circle of people you want to receive help from so the intimacy is really important and during my PhD I realized that it's really near impossible to take one act and say that this is what will happen when this support is given or received that it really depends on the quality of the relationship. Yeah, and I guess on attunement as well, as you say, it kind of needs to meet yes. the need maybe. So if you're coming in with help that's not kind of wanted or perceived as useful, it could be a bit of a or difficult. Yeah, yeah. We, we see that a lot actually with illness. So mm. when somebody has a particular diagnosis, um, a significant one, people are very well-meaning and they're well-intentioned, but we see in the literature that the support is is often not what's needed. So it's not from the right person. It's not the right kind of support. It comes at the right time. It might be intrusive, all right? So you, you might relate to this idea of somebody going, oh, I'm here if you want to talk, talk to me, tell me about it. And you're like, I don't want to talk about it. I want to be distracted. And the other person has this idea of the support you need and they want to bestow it on you and they want to feel good about themselves for doing so. And they're really well-intentioned. But so often we see people not getting what they need in those contexts. Uh, so I think that is a really interesting aspect that support can can often go wrong. It often does. Mm -hmm. And I suppose more listening to what people actually want and better articulation of what it is someone actually needs can mm -hmm. help uh, get the right match, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that, certainly in relation to kind of physical health conditions, as you say, kind of attuning it. It, it kind of well um, and I guess maybe there's a lot to think about isn't there yeah. it's so it's so fundamental I suppose to our our kind of emotional health and our physical health in terms of the, the not just the relationships that we have but the quality of them as well maybe Did, and I guess I'm really interested in your research Emery on, on the kind of the physical impacts maybe in terms of stress and, and I wonder yeah. might you say a bit about that yeah so I suppose we all can appreciate that relationships are emotionally beneficial aren't they good quality relationships we can all relate to that we might see children forming friendships and we'll be happy for them or we might see people out having a cup of tea and a chat and and we respond and think well that that's really nice something really positive 
but there's quite a physical impact of relationships as well. So it can affect in lots of different ways. And one main way is in terms of coping with stress. So when we meet stress in our lives, and we all will, and that's absolutely fine, we'll have a response to it. So we might feel our heart rate increasing, maybe we, we're breathing faster, um, the stress hormone cortisol is released, and this all helps us cope with the stress in front of us. But it also has a wear and tear effect on the body. So you don't want to be stressed all the time. You don't want to have this big response all the time. And having good quality relationships can help you feel that you can cope with stress when you face it. So instead of having a really large response, a really big stress response, you might have a little bit of a more muted one, right? So less wear and tear on the body. So that's one way that the relationships can help. They enhance our ability to cope with stress and they keep that stress response to a healthy level instead of a really exaggerated level. So that's that's one way. And I think another interesting way is actually around sleep. So if you think about it, uh, sleep is often thought about as something we do individually, but for a large part of many adults' lives, they will sleep beside somebody else or their sleep will be interrupted by caring responsibilities, for example. And uh, Dr. Wendy Troxell, I'm a big fan of her research in this area. She's a psychologist and sleep scientist. So she kind of takes a, a wider approach. It's more than an individual phenomenon. And we know from this research that relationship quality can even be disruptive to sleep because you're ruminating and you're dwelling on it and you're not able to fall asleep. So besides the physical acts of somebody pulling the covers off you or waking you up in the middle of the night or having a different alarm to you in the morning, we also have that emotional piece where if our relationships are not going well, that we might reflect on that and ruminate on that. And that can disrupt our sleep as well. So stress and sleep are two of many ways in which the relationships can affect our physical health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it, it's a bit of a, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? I guess a, a kind of a continued stress response in combination with lack of sleep can bring you to different places, maybe, or and can maybe be risk factors for further difficulties. For things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sleep is so important. It's so, you know, we yeah. wouldn't spend so much time sleeping if it wasn't important. So yeah. I think anything yeah. that disrupts your sleep isn't good and there can, there yeah. can be the practical aspects of relationships and the emotional aspects as I say and of yeah. course even conflict in relationships might lead to a knock-on stressful event that you're thinking about so that sleep and stress parts are, are integrated as well to some degree yeah. yeah yeah and I guess that idea we might think about in psychology that you're always relating to someone whether they're present or not yeah I guess that idea of the rumination so you might be going around about something whether that person is in the bed next to you or whether they're somewhere else but I guess you are always in relationship which makes me think a little bit Emma about then the, the counterpoint of that of, of kind of loneliness and I wonder if, if you might be able to share a bit about kind of your research to date and on young people and the, their experiences in that respect yeah, so I suppose first I might just describe what loneliness is, maybe. Mm. So, yeah, yes. so loneliness is, as you said, it's kind of that counter to it's the feeling that you have a lack of social connection. So it's the unpleasant feeling that we experience when we feel that there's a mismatch between the social connections that we actually have and those that then we might like to have. And it's not just the number of social connections we have. So you mentioned there about the quality of our relationships. So it's not just about the number, but also the quality or, you know, how close we feel to our social connections and our social relationships. So you might have heard that saying before of, you know, you can still feel lonely in a crowd. In other words, you can have many social connections, but if you feel that you lack a sense of belonging or maybe that you lack connection with those, you can still feel lonely. So a person may have a, a wide circle of family and friends and can still experience loneliness if these relationships don't fulfill those expectations um, that we have about our, our relationships. Um, and then so we did some research, um, some in an interview study with some young adults about loneliness. And I think our findings were really interesting in that regard um, about we asked them about what do they believe loneliness means? And also, um, what do they believe causes or maintains feelings of loneliness in this group? So one key thing, I suppose, that's important to remember with loneliness is that loneliness and being alone are two different things. Um, and loneliness is a feeling that involves our own thinking and our own beliefs about our social connections. And I have some quotes from our young adults that I think really nicely sum up um, what loneliness means for some people who experience it. So one young person said that for them, uh, being alone is definitely more of a physical reality 
whereas loneliness is more of a kind of an emotional and a mental reality. So I think that's a really nice distinction there between being alone and what loneliness is. And some other descriptions of, of what does loneliness mean to you included uh, words like alienation, sadness, to a certain degree, one person said depression. Another person said that they most closely related being lonely to feeling different, not having the right group of people, not having someone I could call my clan. And another person said about loneliness was being in a crowded room and feeling like you're on your own anyways. So I think they really nicely describe loneliness and how it might feel for somebody who, who experiences that. Mm. Yeah, they're really nice examples, aren't they? Because it's not something we often speak about, and certainly in relation to younger people. Um, it, it seems like it's got, it's, uh, I'd be interested to hear what maybe what you both think. It feels like it's a little almost more acceptable or something or or expected in an older adult cohort to, to kind of have an experience of loneliness, but there's maybe some elements of stigma around that too in, in younger people. Absolutely, yeah. Loneliness carries um, a social stigma where, you know, people mightn't be as likely to speak about loneliness for fear that other people might perceive them more negatively. And I suppose that common perception that loneliness is more common or, or only occurs in older people who might be, you know, living on their own or socially isolated. That also feeds into that stigma for younger age groups who absolutely do experience loneliness. And loneliness is actually quite common in younger age groups mm -hmm. and can happen to anybody across the lifespan at, at any stage of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think of that does contribute to the stigma, but I do think that we are becoming more open about speaking about loneliness, even webinars and events like today and the, the interest in an event like this um, even just shows that people are becoming more willing to speak about loneliness and to show the importance of social connection. Um, yeah, as well. Yeah, it's really important, isn't it? I guess the and one of the maybe the, the experience of loneliness potentially is feeling that you're alone in it so that other people don't feel as lonely or or maybe there's a lot of talk about social media uses in there. And I guess it's as, as you kind of the research would say, it's kind of how we use it. Maybe it's but I guess we might have the perspective that other people don't feel as lonely. Absolutely. Yeah. And we found that in our research with young adults that they mentioned, you know, we did ask them about social media um, and they mentioned about how sometimes the experience that you might have on social media, it, it's that other people put up quite a highlight reel of their own lives and often people put up the happy times on social media. So you may be looking at others on social media and feel that, you know, you're not as popular as them or maybe your social life isn't quite as exciting. But you mentioned there about how um, how we use social media is, is important. I think that's a really important point just to pick up on that. The research does suggest that the social media use is linked to higher levels of loneliness, but it's likely that the relationship is not quite as straightforward that higher use of social media is linked to higher levels of loneliness. The link might actually be um, related to how we use social media. So things like passive use, like scrolling or just like mindlessly watching videos, things like that, without any interaction with other people, can be linked to higher levels of loneliness and poor psychological well-being. Whereas actively using social media to keep in contact with friends or, you know, maybe if a friend has moved abroad or something like that, maintaining those social connections, but that's actually associated with um, greater psychological well-being and less loneliness. So the key message there, I suppose, is that it's not just how much you use social media, but also how we're using it. And um, that's really important there. Yeah, I guess like everything, it's complicated, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it, it but it's, it's interesting even just to have this conversation today, there could be hundreds of thousands of people kind of on social media, kind of scrolling and, and kind of, what's the word, maybe lurking, so not necessarily interacting. And, and I guess it's that that's kind of going to be more, going to generate more loneliness or disconnection. I suppose the thing about relationships is, is kind of how we connect, isn't it, in ways that can I suppose promote meaning and as well as kind of improving our, our kind of emotional and mental health Um, I think maybe we're just going to pause for a second and look at a couple of the questions coming in just as they're as they're kind of coming in so maybe a question for Anne-Marie here so do you see a value in or have you ever studied the value of peer support um, among parents of sick children with long-term illness and if you could discuss the merits and challenges of this so thank you for that question that's a really good question. So we have studied the experience of parents uh, coping with children with chronic illness and something that they have raised is that peer support will be really beneficial. And there is quite a large literature on the topic. But what we have to do is be careful that the peer support provided 
is of good quality that meets needs and also that doesn't become something uh, a channel for inaccurate medical information, for example. So there's quite a large literature on how people engage with support groups around different illnesses, for example, and some of the benefits really are finding people who've that shared experience with. So again, the connection is important because nobody knows what it's like unless they've been through it themselves. So if you can find a group of people who can sort of relate, that will help. It's a place to vent, it's a place for the emotional support where things get messy is that informational support right where, where the information isn't accurate because your child's situation is not identical to another child's situation and what worked for you mightn't work for them so i know sometimes uh people with oversight i suppose over children's care pediatric care would have concerns about how do we give or facilitate peer support in a way that doesn't compromise the informational support and the medical support. So something we have discussed uh, with different pediatric teams is the idea of having peer support that's facilitated by someone who, who's, who has a medical background. And of course, that's a little tricky too, because of course the doctors are quite occupied with the medical care. And it also changes the nature of the support of space as well, because you have an outsider there who's got a different experience. But certainly there is a role there for peer support. And I think if you can find that support and lean into it as suits you and take the emotional piece and be skeptical about the information, a bit of healthy skepticism, I think it can be very beneficial with those caveats. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I guess, it, yeah, again, it's sort of it's thinking about the right help, isn't it, at yeah. the right time in many ways. And I guess maybe that maybe that leads us into thinking about kind of living with chronic illness or long term conditions. Um, and I suppose just thinking a bit more about social support there and how it might affect things or how it might be helpful. Do you want to say a bit more about that or? Yeah, so that so again for people who are living themselves with their chronic illness who aren't necessarily the parents, that same literature on support groups, those kind of caveats yeah. are relevant. So the emotional support can be good. I'm not saying informational support is bad, but we just don't know if it's accurate or not. So there is a lovely literature on online support groups uh, that looks at these kind of interactions and that uh, people's experiences of them. And people often find some solace in them. They find some informational support. They also sometimes have, how can I put this? The group can often be a place for people to vent about the downsides, right, of course, of chronic illness. And sometimes that's not what others want to hear. So you might find yourself in a situation where you're listening to a lot of negative conversations about symptoms and so on. So that can be the downside to it. And I think another really tricky dimension is actually accessing these groups because I've talked there about online context, but the in-person connection can be so valuable if you can find it, but it, it can be difficult to find for your particular situation. So that's why we see a lot of online support groups popping up, which can be really beneficial. Um, I was actually in one myself for a time uh, because I had a gestational diabetes while during pregnancy. So that's not a long-term condition though it does pose risks for diabetes later so I might find myself back but there was a support group for that and it, it was beneficial it's lovely to see the other people are in the same situation uh, it kind of gives you some quick information uh, but those downsides are still there now if we put the support groups aside I suppose for people who have a chronic illness what often it hinders you getting support is the actual nature of the illness because you might have physical symptoms that impede your social participation. So you can't get out and about as much. You can't build connections. You might be able to participate in the support, the sport or the crafts or whatever it is that you like to do. So your actual social participation might be dampened. But to allow you to access support, if it's possible to maintain that social participation and engagement, that would be something really important to do. So you might not be able to continue with the athletics you were involved with, but you might be able to go swimming, right? Or you might not every week be able to do whatever class you were doing, but you might be able to go sometimes. And I think maintaining that social engagement opens up your world. So it's good for your mental health and the connections there, but it also helps maintain relationships you already have. 
And it probably gives you those physical health benefits too, because you're out and about. I suppose one other way that helps that maintaining social participation, even if the form is different, is that we're seeing an emerging literature now linking that kind of social engagement to, I suppose, a, a lower risk of um, cognitive decline later. So it keeps you sharp mentally to be out and about because you're exposed to new ideas and actually new faces, right? So your world is a lot more varied. And it's, it's sort of like use it or lose it in terms of your cognitive function. So I think maintaining social participation, even if it's in a different form, is something that we really important to do if you can at all if you're living a chronic illness it's that it's that flexibility in it isn't it as you say to be able to try to get to the meaning or or the value in something and how you might be able to meet that need it might look a bit different yeah um but there's maybe some consideration about what what part of an activity might have been important to you whether it's the social bit or whether it's the different bit and how you can do that in a different way as you say and it also kind of has huge impact on brain health as well as kind of psychological health and I guess kind of just kind of going back to something you were saying earlier about kind of accessing social support with with a long-term condition as well there's something about kind of thinking about your own needs in that isn't there as you said the difference yeah. between it's I'm kind of bringing it up again because it's so important that kind of practical support and, and social support um, or emotional support and maybe knowing your own support networks in that mm. and maybe and I, thinking of, I, think go on. People, I think people often when something happens, like we're diagnosed with an illness and that diagnosis point uh, for people with chronic illness and for parents when it when relevant is really, really impactful. And we carry mm -hmm. that with us, that, that time of stress and the kind of support we wanted to get at the time. And it's usually focused around the medical aspect, not the psychological piece. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah, I suppose that makes us think about how we'll manage something long term and we're not really guided as to how to articulate our support needs. We're just given information about the particular illness, but we're not actually told, well, this is useful information to explain to your partner or to your friend or even to your workplace, for example, if you need particular accommodations. But I think that's something that if we had that would help because nobody in your environment can read your mind and their idea of what you need might be your idea. So you can feel a bit frustrated, like why aren't they helping or this isn't helping, but they don't know. So reflecting on what you actually need and thinking about how can I articulate that clearly could could really change the kind of support you get from from people around you. But we don't get we don't get support in how to access support, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Yeah, I guess we get the information piece, don't we? And yeah, but not not the rest of it. And sometimes it's helpful, I guess, in terms of thinking about my recent work in kind of people living with physical conditions. It's for those who are supporting someone, even just thinking about when you were last sick, what you found helpful or unhelpful, and then imagining someone is managing that on a long term basis. And as you say, we often offer what we think we might want or what we feel that we might find helpful. So it's really helpful to have those conversations around actually what are the needs uh, kind of from both parties. Yeah, and I guess that, that I suppose in, in many conditions they can be invisible or, or unpredictable. Yeah. So those needs might really change. So do, does someone want to be invited out or do they want to be left for a little while? So it's really kind of thinking through what's going to be most useful, isn't it? Mm. Um, I see a few questions coming in there, which you might kind of consider actually. So, because I think it's quite an important one, which, maybe not just for people living with long-term conditions, but more generally. So a comment on feeling low and therefore hard to reach or maintain relationships, which I think is a really good question. So we know that they're really important, but sometimes how we feel can maybe, as I was saying earlier, we don't come as blank slates. So kind of how, and so we have our own patterns of relating, don't we, that we've kind of developed from childhood and how we might see the world and navigate the world, but also kind of feeling low might impact how we, connect and what might make that difficult and I don't know maybe Emma even thinking about how that might really relate to loneliness or do you have any thoughts on that absolutely yeah so I suppose like feeling loneliness um in itself isn't necessarily a mental health problem but I suppose when you speak about feeling low there like loneliness and mental health and um, other mental health conditions like depression and anxiety are are linked and I suppose a person's mental health might make you feel lonely and then vice versa feeling lonely might also damage a person's mental health so Although feeling lonely and, and depression are separate, there is a link there between the two. And often, even I mentioned earlier, some words described by people 
to describe loneliness, they mentioned feeling sad and, and feeling low and things like that. Um, and I suppose, um, yeah, people who, who experience depression or feeling low might have difficulties in maintaining their relationships because of maybe the symptoms or they might experience social isolation. Um, so I suppose some of the things that, you know, to manage loneliness include that might also extend to, you know, uh, feeling low is so like acknowledging and accepting your loneliness um, is, is one kind of key, key way to help manage that um, and reflecting on why you feel lonely, maybe to help identify triggers and to figure out ways to, fi to find that connection again. Um, yeah, so the two are, I suppose, very much linked. Yeah. I guess we, we, I was just thinking about that phrase, you know, from Sartre that hell is other people. I guess hell is also a lack of other people, isn't it? Or or difficult relationships. It's it's kind of messy. But as you say, there's something about maybe, and this is maybe specific to loneliness, but, but I mean, relationships generally of, of trying to understand kind of how that's come about and how you might meet that need, isn't it? Or how you might reach out to people. And I guess maybe that's what the question is, is speaking to in a sense, in terms of, and I don't know, Anne-Marie, if you have any thoughts on that about how kind of feeling low might get in, might be an obstacle or it might be tricky in relationships yeah it is tricky and certainly when people feel low in the context of depression we don't we don't we see lower social participation right because our motivation to go and do things is, is lower so it's really how do you go and live this full social life if you just don't feel feel like it and uh, I think something that can help is when when you're not feeling low to nurture relationships and also there's a literature on developing lots of different groups right so that you can access different kinds of relationship as suit you so if we think about groups for a moment and why they can be so helpful if you think for example of uh, friends you might have in the workplace but when you retire a lot of that structure falls away so having a number of social groups that you can engage with really buffers you when you lose one so it might be that when you're feeling low, you don't feel like interacting with people in your immediate environment who know you so well that they'll know things aren't right. But you might be able to go along to whatever club or society or craft event or sport or whatever it is. You might just about be able to go and do that, right? So having multiple groups open to you can often help with that. And again, I think articulating to, to those intimate relationships that you might have articulating what your support needs are and how at times you'll feel low and having a way of explaining that a kind of shorthand between you and people in your life might help um, and having a couple of intimate ties is really really beneficial to nurture those because they're the people who might when you don't feel like reaching out they'll reach out to you so that's what I would say the literature says that having a number of groups can be really helpful in case one falls away that nurturing intimate relationships when you can is helpful because when you don't feel like reaching out, they might reach out. And I think those are things that we can all try to do to some extent. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a real kind of similarity there. And as you say, the kind of them having a wide and diverse range of different yeah. groups is really important. So there's flexibility in the same way that we might have a flexibility in our own internal world. So having a different range of strategies or coping resources to manage different problems. So we're not just using the same thing. It's kind of not always putting your eggs in one basket, maybe. And that yeah. being important kind of in our minds, but also in our external worlds. Um, That's helpful for I, the people in our life as well, of yeah. course. Because sometimes Yeah, exactly. You know, Emma's research would have shown that people don't always want to reach out about loneliness because they're burdening their mm. friends, right? Who might wonder why is what, what's why you feeling lonely? Aren't we friends? But having a number of people to go to can might boost your confidence in accessing connection when you need it because you know that you're not uh, putting all your egg, eggs in one basket or or placing any kind of burden on somebody, which people can sometimes feel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's often a fear, isn't it? And I guess the other the other part, maybe not even necessarily being low, but I suppose we bring our bodies to relationships too. And we might, I guess, anxiety can be a huge part of that. So I guess there might also be difficulties for people. It's like, oh, okay, reach out and connect. But sometimes that can be really difficult, can't it? In terms of maybe anxiety socially or or kind of thinking about that can be tricky. So in terms of kind of having that sort of understanding as well, I guess I'm thinking that just I guess this is more kind of from a clinical psychology perspective just kind of reflecting on that idea that that can be an obstacle too so social anxiety kind of we might get caught up in what we might call safety behavior so kind of doing things to try to reduce our anxiety socially to avoid rejection but that can actually leave us disconnected 
-hmm. in relationships or, or kind of cut off. And so I suppose it's kind of that interlap, isn't it, between kind of internal, external world again. So it's not just this, I guess it's kind of important to say, isn't it? It's not just kind of two people relating to each other in a very uncomplicated way. There can be yeah. lots going on, can't there? There is. And even being around other people might be helpful at times yeah. with that. And certainly, you know, if you think about going out and about in your community, those ties, those people you see, the person who walks the dog at the same time that you go for your walk every morning, these are what uh, psychologists and sociologists might call micro friendships or weak ties. So, those, you know, the delivery driver, the person you buy the cup of tea or coffee from, so you're not friends per se, but you see them a lot. And those can actually be massively beneficial and quite easy to access depending on your community because it doesn't require you to invest a lot. It just requires you to be out and about in the world a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And those those ties can be helpful because they they might form they might turn into friendships over time. They might uh, facilitate you meeting more people in your network. And they can also strengthen your, I suppose, sense of community where you live. So I think even if you're not, you know, ringing everyone up to have a really deep and meaningful conversation about life or whatever it is, or engaging in, in a particular hobby together, being out and about uh, and meeting those kind of people day to day can in itself be something that's beneficial as well. Yeah, but, that's really, it's a really important point, isn't it? You can really moderate your level or kind of, so meet yourself where you are. So as you say, if you're not up for the, the deep chat or the, mm. the maybe the heavy social interaction, there's still real value in those micro relationships or being in the world around people that are familiar. Yeah, Emma, it looked like you were going to say something there. Yeah, I was just going to add to what Anne-Marie said there about kind of like collectively doing something in a group, you know, it's like some of the advice for people when they're feeling lonely is, you know, maybe to join a new activity or, you know, join uh, where you might be able to meet people. But even if you find the, the thought of having to go and meet new people daunting, even just doing something collectively in a group like joining a running club or something that you're already interested in. But maybe can you do that in a group setting? It's similar to what Anne-Marie says. You might be able to find those or nurture those weak ties. And as well, you might have a shared interest with somebody, which straight away is, is kind of something you have in common with somebody else there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess it's that combination, isn't it, of the social connection and, and maybe finding a meaning or purpose, yeah. which is really going to be really beneficial for your, your mental health, isn't it? Yeah. And um, just looking at a couple of questions as they're coming in. So I might put this one's interesting because it, it comes up a lot, maybe. And I think it's very much kind of spoken a lot about at the moment in terms of this idea of toxic relationships and the impact. And I don't know. If, if either of yourselves have any done any research on toxic relationships and impact or, or maybe can speak to something around that because I know it's it's a hot topic in sense of what's spoken about currently it's definitely a hot topic in terms of what's spoken about publicly I think research often takes a bit of time to catch up mm -hmm. with discourse on these kind of topics but certainly there is a literature um, on ambivalent relationships so they are relationships with a mix of positive and negative characteristics and actually, most people's relationships are a bit ambivalent, right? We They're not 100% positive, most of them. There might be some little niggle or some conflict from time to time. But it's okay that they're ambivalent. It's okay that there's a mix because the good generally outweighs those negative aspects. And then relatively few of our relationships would be classified as entirely negative or in, in general terms, those toxic ones. And I suppose because we don't have much of a literature focusing on those toxic ones, because they're not that common, uh, we, we don't have as much to draw on. But certainly, I think reflecting on what you like in relationships, what suits you, what values you have, what activities you like to do and what your own needs are, might help you pull back from these relationships that are, are not, not, help, not meeting your needs. And I don't think anyone should necessarily feel guilty about doing that because it's something that might have to be done. And because our relationships change across the lifespan anyway. I think when we're very young, we think we'll carry every friendship with us over time. But actually, as we grow older, we tend to shrink our networks a little bit in favor of quality. So if that's something people feel they have to do, I think they should feel that that's OK to do. Mm. It's, yeah, it's a really important point. So I guess, it, as you say, maybe one thing that may be worth highlighting there, as you say, the research isn't kind of fully there. So it's yeah. maybe there's, there's something to say there about kind of having that discernment for, for maybe 
people in popular culture there might be a lot of ideas around yeah. kind of ideas around I guess narcissism is spoken around a lot is there are toxic relationships and, and maybe a bit of caution maybe in, in terms of what we're consuming in terms of really want that to be backed up by by kind of solid research before mm. kind of definitives are, are kind of concluded I don't know I what you say we, we all have relationships and we have people mm. in our lives so for that reason when we hear a term like toxic relationships we can feel oh I can relate to this you know I'm have this friend who's whatever they're like or this person at work but of course the literature thinks differently about those things and it might be that there's a more specific research base out there so there might be a research base on intimate partner violence for example that's that specific or um, childhood adversity and parental neglect but there's not usually a general toxic relationships it's usually focused more on a kind of particular area but certainly it's very difficult um, for people to make sense of all those concepts and I know I feel so lucky in psychology that we get to think and talk about those all the time and make sense of them that's literally my role to get to think and to talk about those things but it, it is very difficult to make sense of it so I, what I would take from that kind of literature is that more specific focus around intimate partner violence or parental relationships or workplace bullying. There's literature on all of those topics. The more general concept isn't something that's so commonly studied. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful to, to highlight. And um, I'm just looking at another question there, which uh, so uh, which I think is a really interesting question, actually. So and thank you for all the questions coming through. They're really kind of making me think about things and hopefully kind of adding to our discussion. Advice on how to nurture relationships, particularly if you aren't a big talker, which I quite like, because a lot of people aren't. Um, I know culturally we like to talk in Ireland, but a lot of people that doesn't suit us or work so well. And I think, Amory, you had mentioned a bit about kind of maybe nurturing kind of different types of relationships, but I don't know if either of you maybe want to say a bit on how to nurture them if you're not a big talker. Yeah, um, Amory, if you really want to say something on that no you go ahead and I'll jump in if needs yeah I suppose it's interesting to think about that because a lot of what we would say about nurturing relationships are um I suppose it does all revolve around talking but I suppose those what I mentioned already but maybe activities and things that maybe necessarily you don't have to always talk and even I know certainly in younger generations we're not big phone call I know it's kind of a stereotypical thing about younger people that often it's texting or uh, rather than having picking up the phone and calling somebody um, but I suppose yeah finding things that you have in common that maybe you can do together that you don't necessarily have to be having deep conversations all the time can help to nurture those relationships yeah in different different settings maybe as well so I guess for a lot of people it can be quite intense can't it if you're going to go for a coffee or drink with someone this sort of one-on-one -on -one, whereas maybe being outside or both involved in a task is going to kind of maybe calm your nervous system down a fair bit and kind of take the pressure off a bit so again maybe it's sort of knowing kind of your own needs or, or kind of having a bit of an inquiry around that and thinking okay well what am I interested in as you say and and where could I kind of do that so it's it's a bit diluted maybe in that kind of mm -hmm. intensity with people you can yeah. both be focused on something outside of you um, and, and we then you can connect in that way yeah. We found in our interview study with um, young adults, we asked them about different types of relationships and also, you know, if they found having one, just having one per one good person or having a mix of friends was was helpful for their loneliness and for their overall um, mental health, I suppose. And what some people said is that it's nice to have different friends for different things. So I remember one person mentioned about, well, I have my football friends, then I also have my friends for something else. So you might have a shared interest. And that's okay. You don't have to have a friend for everything. You can have friends that you kind of, I suppose, dip in and dip out of for different things like that, different interests. Mm -hmm. Where I guess you can express different parts of yourself. Absolutely. So if you if you have someone who you're really interested in football and you're a good friends who aren't, you don't get to express that part or, or inhabit that part of you that might be quite active in a different way. So I guess it, it's again that flexibility and more holistic way of being you, isn't it? That with a kind of whole range of people, you get to express different parts of, of who you are. Yeah. I think there's more out there than I feel like there is than there used to be like only at the weekend someone was telling me about an opportunity to go bird watching where everyone walked along and somebody said here's such a bird here's another and you didn't necessarily talk to anybody else you just there's a bird I'm walking there's a bird and it just sounded like a lovely mm. kind of healthy low pressure anyone can join 
activity and I was just amazed to hear about those kind of things popping up now um, and hiking as well uh, yeah. it's not for me but it's certainly something where you'd have a great excuse not to talk because you're focused on the route so I think identifying those opportunities or even um, in, in if your local library sometimes ours is excellent for things like historical talks you sit listen enjoy be around people talk or don't talk uh, th those I wouldn't feel Sometimes people can think, well, there's not much out there and there might not be in your area, but it's certainly worth having a look because I think I see more now that uh, things have opened up more since COVID. We see more opportunities and new ways, I suppose, of facilitating interaction and connection, which I think is really nice. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a whole other world in many ways, isn't it? I guess and a lot more is kind of talked about or acceptable mm -hmm. to, to kind of consider. And as you say, the I mean, I love the idea of the bird watching. I might, yeah. uh, might sign up. <laughs> but um, there's something too about being in nature, isn't there? Um, so maybe having that, I guess we, we know there's some research on kind of being outside or being in nature can be really helpful, I suppose. But again, thinking about that, maybe for some people that might be a really pleasant experience, the bird watching. But I guess it's also thinking about how we are bringing ourselves to that. So if you're really anxious or feeling very dysregulated in a nature setting, it's not going to be mm -hmm. restorative or helpful. So I guess it's, again, tuning into what's going to best meet your own needs, isn't it? And as you say, there being loads of different opportunities for that. Um, OK, so just looking at other questions coming in, but just as we're doing that, just as you mentioned COVID there, um, maybe. I don't know if you wanted to say something just briefly about how you think COVID has affected relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when COVID kicked in, uh, it's inevitable really that we, we come around to it because it did affect mm -hmm. relationships. We already had a little bit to go on in terms of the research when epidemics happened elsewhere, right? So there wasn't a wor worldwide event, but there could be kind of shorter term incidents where you would see the effects on relationships. For example, uh, divorce rates increased in certain places where there was an epidemic. So there would be the, the stress, I suppose, of that situation. And there's a lot of research on this topic. I am not convinced of the quality of all of it. OK, but um, so I'm not going to go into that in, in depth. But one thing I observed is that we socially, I suppose, couldn't meet. Right. So we might have developed habits of not connecting because for a while connection was dangerous. And that's a really hard thing to think about, but actually connecting was was dangerous. So so we didn't do it or we reduced it dramatically. And I know for myself even that um, it took a while to get out of the habit of not connecting. So I think it'd be, I would not be surprised if people were still in the social habits they had established during that time, which might, like any habit, take some time to break. I also think that it gave us a chance to identify what's really important to us in relationships. Who did you miss the most? Who did you really want to see? And to focus on that. And I think for most people, that's probably a positive reflective, reflective time. But it might leave some people feeling like, well, I don't have anywhere to go now. You know, there is everyone's focused on their immediate family or their their closest friends and whose circle am I in? So I think there's a few ways that possibly affected people through developing particular habits and also helping us kind of evaluate the relationships we have, which for some people is positive and then for others uh, is a little bit more challenging. And for those people for whom it's challenging, I'd say I don't think anybody minds somebody reaching out and saying hello, you know, as you're out and about or attending a group. The other person might equally be feeling like they lack connection and really welcome it. So I think that's important to bear in mind that we're we're having conversation as if all of us have a particular lack of connection. But of course, lots of other people do, too. And it might be that those listening are the people to reach out and kind of reconnect. That could be something to think about as well. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, no, I think that's that's really helpful. I'm just thinking, seeing a question there coming in about supporting people who maybe feel very isolated or disconnected that important part as we've sort of been speaking about kind of maybe reaching out and connecting and, and sort of making those kind of journeys back from from the kind of last few years and, and I guess kind of as you were saying earlier I'm really maybe there may not be something directly in your area but kind of looking further beyond that and kind of maybe a bit of self-compassion too and that we've all gotten into habits and, and actually we've had a huge experience in COVID so there might be a bit of 
people might have different lead in times back or to something different yeah. and that being okay so not being hard on yourself for for those changes but giving kind of a bit more time and, and kind of support in that I think that's a very good point Susan we also asked um young adults in our study about COVID and it was actually quite surprising to hear that for some people the issue wasn't necessarily about the loneliness that they felt during COVID restrictions but it was actually that adjustment period after when things went back to the so-called kind of normal and people were back out and there was this expectation particularly for young people to be back um socializing as you know the way we were pre-COVID and that actually some of them found that adjustment period really difficult or even more difficult than the actual maybe some of the loneliness that they might have been expected to feel during the restrictions so I think it is really important just to ask people I suppose what they feel comfortable or how they feel comfortable connecting and things like that. Yeah, and absolutely. It's such, a, it's such an important point, isn't it? It's that transition back, isn't it? Often it's the transition for us that can be difficult as well as the, the experience itself. Um, and certainly I know from kind of working in, in kind of, as I was saying, people living with long term conditions is really interesting. Actually, people have such different experiences, didn't they? So a lot of people were saying, well, welcome to my world. You know, like I've actually been I've because of my condition, I haven't, as you were saying earlier, I've really been able to do the things that I might want to do as, as consistently as I can. So this is actually quite usual for me to be restricted. And um, so it's getting I, mean, I guess for a lot of people, it was getting a sense of what that might be like for a huge amount of, of, of people. Um, and then I guess this idea that we're just going to go back to normal at the click of a finger or back to the way things were, and that's not going to be the case. But I guess also at the same time, knowing that there is kind of, I guess maybe for me, I'm thinking of the main things that we're talking about today is that nobody is alone in feeling loneliness, mm -hmm. if that if that makes sense. Um, and relationships, I guess, can be very complicated at times, but very rewarding and satisfying and massively impact on our well-being kind of bi-directionally. Um, I don't know, I guess kind of as we're sort of drawing to an end, I'll just have a look at the questions as we as we're kind of considering that. But I wonder, um, Anne Marie, and maybe I'll come to you then, Emmett, the kind of most important things that you think we've spoken about today or that you'd really want people to kind of take away with them. I would probably say that the connection is important. We all need it. And sometimes when we feel we need it, we might feel there's something wrong with us, right? That our needs aren't already met, but that's not the case. And that people will be generally quite receptive to, to connection. And also that articulating what your support needs are if you're someone with an illness is something that might help you get the support you need. So you might take for granted that you don't need to do that, but doing that might just be helpful in getting the support you need. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, and Emma, for you, kind of maybe what started from your own research or what you'd be kind of really keen for people to take away with them from our yes. conversation today. So I suppose mine is kind of, it's aligns with what Anne-Marie said really, but I suppose mm -hmm. that loneliness is actually very common. And that feeling lonely from time to time is a very normal part of being human and the human experience and that there's no shame or there's no shame in feeling lonely. Um, and I suppose, yeah, that we don't always necessarily need to cure loneliness as such, but maybe to promote social connection in the first place and nurture those social relationships and um, to help people manage their loneliness and to provide them with tools to, to manage their loneliness so that they can prevent that kind of persistent loop of feeling stuck in loneliness uh, happen. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess that there are there are kind of people out there, there are tools out there not to not to plug a, a aware, but I guess there are in terms of kind of what we mainly offer is, is sort of support and education and well-being programs. So I guess there's a real invitation maybe for people to to really reach out where they can for support. And I think we've kind of touched on it's a it's such a huge area. We've only given a real snapshot of, of things today. And I guess maybe just thinking about for people who maybe are feeling disconnected or isolated or lonely, kind of remembering as we're saying those those supports are there. And and if anything has been kind of triggering or activating today in terms of relationships, really, I guess, really minding yourselves in that, you know, maybe kind of really, again, kind of that self-compassion piece is really important and, and really inviting you to, to seek support, whether that be from your own social support networks or a mental health professional or GP, if anything has, if you've been left with anything that's been, that's been difficult, but hopefully it's been good food for thought in terms of thinking about how relationships can affect us. Um, really want to thank you both Anne-Marie and Emma for a really interesting discussion. It's been really, really useful. 
Uh, thanks for, for joining along today, everyone else. And thank you for all your questions. And um, my apologies if we didn't get to your question. Unfortunately, we can't take any other questions uh, after the webinar. But as I said, do kind of reach out to support networks if you're left with anything, anything more pressing. Um, so just before I let you go, so we'll just give a bit of a note on the webinar for next month. So our June webinar is going to coincide with Men's Mental Health Month. So we're delighted to welcome sports pundit Brent Pope renowned architect Hugh Wallace and journalist broadcaster John Murray for a panel discussion on men's mental health. So we'll be talking about their personal experiences, why it's important for men to talk and how they're looking after their mental health um, today. So if you can, it would be really, really great if you could join us for that. So once our webinar is finished today, you'll find the recording on YouTube later on. As ever, we'll send a follow-up email. Um, Really, uh, we'd be really grateful if you be able to give us your feedback in that email. So in terms of how we might continue to offer topics that are of interest to you and how we might improve the webinars. So again, thank you, Anne-Marie and Emma and everyone for joining. And I hope to see many of you next month. Thank you. Thank you thank you everyone. Everyone. And thanks, Emma and everyone. And just to thank as well, I suppose, everyone who worked with us on this research and the Irish Research Council and spun out who were really lovely to work with and great connections to have. So thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.